Uh, I'd like to welcome Brian Lumley here this afternoon. Brian's popped in and out of our Marlecons since the first one, really. And it's lovely to see him back again this year. Thank you. We might as well start from the beginning. Brian, how did you get started writing? Uh, well, I've always been interested. When I was a soldier, I was in Berlin. I don't know if I've told this story before, um, but you've asked me, so I'll tell you. <laughs> I was a soldier in Berlin, and uh, I'm told in the days of the war on the way. In fact, 1967, yeah, 1967. And it, uh, I was a military policeman, and the headquarters of the military police was in the Olympic Stadium, the Olympic Stadium where Hitler burst several blood vessels when Jesse Orne won all the events, you know, because it, it was against his ethnic beliefs at the time uh, that uh, black people could do this sort of thing, or any people if they weren't born in Germany had a little funny little mustache and a hair part on the wrong side. Uh, Hitler was none of his peculiarities that way. Anyway, that was the same stadium, and that, uh, and that was my headquarters. And I, I worked in a place which was like a set from a James Bond movie, with all the maps of the city behind me which would blink on, the trouble spots were lit up on there. If, uh, if there was a problem downtown, one of these lights would light up, the standby patrol would go down, sort of the business. People were getting killed, trying to escape from East Berlin, coming over the wall, or cut their way through the wire. But at two o'clock in the morning, when the, the last drunken soldier had been locked up for his own benefit, and uh, the last would-be refugee had either escaped or died, there wasn't a lot to do. But you couldn't sleep. The place was rigged up with 15 telephones, there was a white telephone to contact the, uh, the commander of the garrison. There were green telephones to contact the train with Helmstedt. There were radio telephones uh, to contact the Allied forces away from Berlin in West Germany. And it wasn't a place where you, could, where you could afford to relax, but you could read. And I was reading um, a lot of collections, a lot of novels, usually science fiction, fantasy, and uh, horror. And 50% of what I was reading was dire, like John Carter of Mars. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to remember that's a very old, that's a very old book. Frank Belknap Long, incidentally, just to throw on in, is still alive. He lives in a crumbling place in New York, and he's kept alive by the whole writers of America, who do things much like you would do, and give the money to the old guys who've never quite made it in life, in their long lives. Uh, so. I was, I was reading a lot, and 50% of it was very, very poor stuff, 25% was half decent, maybe 10% <coughs> was good. And a lot of the collections that were good were being put together by an editor called August Derleth, who was also a publisher, uh, and ran Arkham House in Sauk City, Wisconsin, which is now, of course, very famous, at the uh, recent World Fantasy Convention where Sylvia and I just back from. Uh, somebody displayed in a showcase an entire a complete set of the Arkham House books, valued at around about $75,000 for a for complete set of books. A rather remarkable. Now, John Carstairs of Mars was not one of those books, I hate to know But Frank Bell, not long, was an Arkham House author. Anyway, I decided one night, while I was doing the night desk, that I could write better than some of this stuff. And having listened to Dear, that dear space detective, believe the ball all over the moon with his gas mask. Uh, you'll appreciate that if you've been reading the stuff I was reading, you would have thought you could write too. So instead of instead of spending the next couple of weeks reading, I wrote two or three short stories and put them away in a drawer. And these drawers were just places to keep forms, police forms. Uh, and I, I thrust these stories, handwritten stories, under some of these forms and found them months later doing the same duty, and read them and thought, they're not bad. Uh, and typed them up, and I typed them up all wrong, single-spaced. Um, I, I didn't number the pages, I stapled them together. And I thought, I'll try them, I'll try them out on this, on August Dillard and see what he thinks. And I didn't know, but he was the dean of Macar Publishers at the time. You didn't send stuff to August Dillard. You might send it to some sub-editor. He didn't have any, as a matter of fact. Today, if you were writing for a publishing house or to a publishing house, you wouldn't aim it at the editorial director or the publishing director. 
but this is literally what I did. And I, so I took these single, badly typed, single spaced, stapled together stories, and not satisfied with that insult, I rolled them up and stuffed them in a cardboard tube <laughs> and sent them surface mail from Berlin to Sauk City, Wisconsin in the USA. And I often, I often wonder what the hell he thought of them when he must nail them to his desk to read them. Because if he didn't, they're good. Every time he turns a page, they're going to roll. Up and roll. But they, they, must have, they must have got something because he, he bought them. Um, and in a very short time, a couple of months, he was talking about putting together, yeah, six months, he was talking about putting together my first collection of uh, short stories. So I suppose you could say, show that I had a, a lucky start. Much as you said, against all odds, like 33,000 to one. Yeah, that's right. Get it, this is about a million and a half to one that these were going to be accepted. But there they were. So we share something in common, we must have had something. That's how, that's how it began. So it started. That's how it started. So it was just then one long blaze of glory from then on, you just went from strength to strength. And I wouldn't say that. You wouldn't say that. I, you know, I did do a few John Costas as a sports detective type. Uh, we find our way. Um, I sold August Della six or seven stories. And he bought them. And I thought, any fool can do this. This is a wonderful way to make money and make a living. You know, what am I doing in the army? I'm a, I'm a raving lunatic. I should be writing stories. And so I wrote a couple in two or three days and sent them. And he wrote a letter back saying, these are total garbage, what are you doing? <laughs> and it dawned on me that uh, yeah, there has to be a little bit of inspiration there. You can't just write anything down. So, you know, I was, I was literally a beginner. It was as simple as that. I wasn't a natural. I had to find my way. Um, and I knew what I'd done wrong. Namely, I hadn't thought it out. I hadn't worried. I had, because of a few lucky sales, I had decided that you could do it every time. And you can't. Uh, so that kind of slowed me down, steadied me down, made me put more thought into it. Uh, and you know, my early, you could say the same with my early novels. Uh, you know, I look back on them now and think, Jesus, God, how did they ever find a way to print? You know, what fool was ever stupid enough to accept them? But on the other hand, if I hadn't written them, it, that, this was where I cut my teeth. Mm. Yeah? Mm. Uh, if I hadn't written them, then I wouldn't have gone on to write anything else. And we all. I suppose every author you'd ever talked to in the world wishes he had never written his first, you know, his first book, but he needed to. Yeah, it wasn't just as easy as, uh, as you make out. Uh, and also, a blaze of glory, I reckon, doesn't come until... Uh, somebody once said to me, how would you like to die? And there are two ways I would like to die. Crushed under the weight of a royalty check. <laughs> say before I had a lady of my own, I used to say it was being made love to by Tina, uh, Tina Turner, Kate Bush, and one of them, I can't remember now, <laughs> on my Greek island, while being mobbed by my fans, <laughs> led, led by their president, Stephen King. <laughs> <coughs> but, uh, you know, so that's what I call a blaze of glory. When you're up there in your ivory tower, maybe, but I don't want to be anyway, because you don't get to meet people. Look at King now, he's He's trapped in his bat festoon mansion somewhere in Maine, you know. Uh, I'd, I'd hate that what isn't going to happen, but uh, if you mean achieve the moderate success, I'll agree with you. That was mostly in the USA. That's right. But nothing at all in Britain. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, there were one or two short stories in, in Britain, but what happened was they found their way into England via the American market. They would first appear in an American uh, collection, which would be bought by a British publisher. And so short stories of mine were finding their way into England, but nothing serious, nothing big. And the reason simple. I was in the army. I knew absolutely nothing about publishing or the weird ways it works. I didn't know about editors because I worked directly through Derleth. He was American. The stuff he was publishing was in America. Uh, when my first agent came along, he was American. He sold me in America. So nothing of mine found its way in England until I left the army. Uh, and that wasn't until the end of 1980. 
So that's that's how come I was published in America. I was published in America. I was read on radio in France and Italy and Germany, but nobody heard of me in England. I never was. I was never in England. Um, the first stories you wrote were mostly Cthulhu, um, and, and that sort of, that, that sort of idiom, yeah. Yeah. Um, then suddenly you came up with this book called Necroscope. Yeah. How did that come about? I mean, it's, it's certainly different from everything else you've done. It's a, it's a strange concept. Well, there was a lot in between, uh, obviously. Um, but the, the Cthulhu mythos had always been fascinating to me. Uh, my first publisher was Derleth, as I said, and Derleth was a big champion of H.P. Lovecraft. And uh, Lovecraft, of course, was the originator of the Cthulhu mythos. And a lot of the authors that were being published by Archimedes were, um, had been influenced by H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, Ramsey Campbell, Colin Wilson, of all people, um, what the hell was it he wrote? I know it was this called the Space Vampires, I believe, as a as a film, wasn't it? Life Force. Life Force. That's yeah, right. It was rather yeah. drastic. Based, based on the, <coughs> the Mind Parasites. The Mind Parasites was the Arkham House book. That's right. Uh, but it was very much under look uh, under Lovecraft's influence. So because I was because Lovecraft was a kind of hero of mine. I, this guy wrote horror stories. No question about that. The Call of Cthulhu, uh, the Color Out of Space, the Haunt of the Dark, these were these were modern classics of the horror story, in my opinion. A bit adjectival, yeah. Uh, full of purple prose, certainly. But uh, they had something, they had a kind of magic, and they had a difference. And they were written in the form of a detective story. And that fascinated me. So when, after I'd worked the Cthulhu mythos out of my system, which took a long time because I wrote an awful lot of books uh, in the mythos and a lot of short stories in the mythos. But when it was kind of gone out of my system, the method of writing, Lovecraft Methodism, stayed with me, which was to write it like a detective story. So, also I've had difficulty with genres. You know, especially now, it's more. Di I have more difficulty with genres now because we've gone from horror to dark fantasy, we've gone to science fiction to cyberpunk, we've gone from horror to splatterpunk, splatterpunk, Jesus, can you imagine the, I've, I've <coughs> said this in a book somewhere, the annual world splattercon, yeah, <laughs> where the awards, you know, where the awards are sculpted working models of lower intestines, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, splatterpunk to me is a kind of literary chicken race to the bathroom, they, these, these guys are vying with each other to see who can throw up first. They've forgotten the basic tenor of the writing, uh, which is a story should have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and should tell a story. And all they're interested in now, the splatterpunks, from my point of view, is a story. Is to is not to tell a story, but simply to horrify. Well, it, we don't need it. We've got enough of it. It's happening all over the world, all the time. So these things, or themes, or ideas, are in my mind when I set out to write. Uh, necroscope. I wanted to tell a story, but I didn't want it to have a genre. I didn't want anybody to be able to say this is science fiction, or this is fantasy, or this is horror, or this is a spy novel. If they wanted to call it an adventure story, if they wanted to call it a weird adventure story, that was all right. But even then, I didn't want to be jacketed as a weird adventure story. I prefer not to be set in a genre, but just to be a writer. And that doesn't mean I'm scorning my early days or saying that uh, I don't want to be a horror writer. If that's how people see me, fine. But I, myself, don't think of these stories as having any specific genre. In, in fact, somebody said, and I was very blushingly, except I don't, but blushingly uh, pleased when somebody said that they should be put in a genre of their own. That would be a very limited one, obviously, <laughs> if it would be called microscope. Um, and the other thing that influenced the, the Necroscope stories, or saga if you want to call it that, is I was pissed off with vampires that do nothing but suck. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. And vampires suck. And really that's all they've done for a hell of a long time. No rhyme or reason for them. I mean, these... 
and they keep coming back. They keep coming back. You can nail Dracula with a flaming cross in the middle of an icy lake and he'll be back in the next epic. Uh, you can bury him six foot deep and some fool will bleed on his grave. <laughs> it happens. Uh, you know, fling him from a castle battlement so his ladies will drag mattresses in the way as he's falling. You're not going to kill the guy. He doesn't die and everybody he meets up with ends up as a vampire. Now what I want to know is, why haven't we been beaten? Why haven't we been defeated 20,000 years ago? We couldn't possibly win against these guys. You have all got to be vampires. I'm the only human being in this room. I know I'm human. I know I'm human. I know I'm human, but if I believe in the books, you lot can't be, because these guys have been around a long time, and thousands of them by now, and they're all gone out for dinner tonight, you know? And you're it? No, I'm it. <laughs> according to that, according to that line of thought, I'm it, or it should have been a long time ago. Now, that kind of vampire doesn't work for me. Uh, there has to be something other than that. There has to be something that limits their ability to spread. So I give the I give vampire, no, vampire legend a lot of thought. And I want to know how they got started, too. Because there seems to me no way. How do we know how the modern legend of the vampire got started? Uh, fear of water, for Christ's sake. Acrophobia? Is it? Um, and the other disease. The, uh, the disease which we've got no cure for at the moment. Rabies. Mm. This, this, this is the... Uh, certainly. This is the, this is the origin. Uh, of the vampire legend, where somebody is bitten by a creature and carries its disease on to the next victim, and so on and so forth. That's, that's where the vampire legend started. And of course it started way back in the days when people didn't understand the disease and the fear of. That's what it is. Oh, that's what it, that's what it was. But if we're going to do it as fiction, we you know, it has to have, we have to be able to, we have to find a specific starting point. And I couldn't find one in this world. So it seemed to me that maybe the, uh, the vampire wasn't human. Or if he was, he was influenced by something that wasn't human. Uh, a parasite. A parasitic infestation, an alien parasitic infestation. And if that concept seems too real or too far out or too uh, unscientific. It's not at all. If you have a look at the liver fluke, yeah. you may not want to. I think I specify, yeah. I specify in a book um, that the idea is not so wild that there could be a, a parasite that creates a vampirism uh, by illustrating it by using the liver fluke as an analog. This thing is dropped by sheep in the form of eggs in sheep droppings. People with bare feet pick it up uh, it becomes a, a creature which infests their liver, gets into their feces too, is dropped, picked up and eaten by sheep. And so the cycle goes on. Uh, that's one. That's one cycle. But have a look at the have a look at frog, the tadpole, which turns into the, the guild creature or the neuter, or any amphibia for that. There are jellyfish and there are fish too, which if there's too many males or too many females, turn into the opposite sex so that they can reproduce. Uh, there's nothing in the necroscope stories which is not belittled in its weirdness by nature herself. So I didn't feel I was going too far or strained too far from the feasible uh, when I introduced those, um, those uh, strains or themes into the stories. Mm. Uh, but I couldn't get it all told, of course, in one book. So the first book uh, dealt with the, the unpleasant, uh, territorial, jealous, greedy, and secretive nature of the beast. And the second one went a little bit more deeply into, the, into, into what he was, exactly. Bamfiri mm. told the story of what the vampire was. That's where it all began. That's how it began. It, 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 it was something that needed to be written. I was fed of a common 
vampires that wander around with long teeth and black cloaks, infesting everybody and yet infesting nobody. Uh, and I wanted to do it differently. And I think I did. Mm. So having decided that you're, you're, you're going to have this, this new type of vampire, um, you then decided to put it back in good old Transylvania. Sure. The source, the place where they all came from in the first place. There's a, there's a reason in my stories. Well, there's a reason in history. Um, if you look back at history, I'm talking about real history now, the Black Plague skipped Transylvania. There's a reason. It came <coughs> sprawling out of the east, carried with rats. Well, rats don't climb mountains for you. They've got no reason. It's cold up there, and they don't like it up there. They like it where it's warm and where there's food. So they don't just jump up mountains. Transylvania is, is, has a horseshoe shape or is a horseshoe shape of mountains of Transylvania in the middle. The Black Plague missed it. So, incidentally, did the Mongols. They annexed it, they said it's ours, but they never conquered it. They wouldn't want it. Of course, well, <laughs> they, would, they would want it. They would want it. It had a lot of vorpods, had a lot of warlords, had a lot of people, but up in the mountains. Yeah, so they, they, they came, they circled it and said, that's it, it's ours, we've got it. It's right in the middle of our territories, but we don't need to conquer it, and they didn't. Um, they left it alone. R have a look at Romania. Call it Romania instead of Transylvania because Transylvania is only a small part. Um, Romania, its very name tells you uh, what it is. Uh, it has its own language, a Romance language. The closest you'll get to it is Old Latin or the modern Italian language, but it's separated from Italy. So how come it survived? Well, the language survived in the same way that the the plague never got it, in the same way that the invaders never got it. Not truly, didn't ever take it. Because it's isolated. It's got the Danube on one side. Today, we'd go across the boat. In those days, there was somebody waiting on the other side to kill you. <laughs> and, uh, exactly, it wasn't an easy thing to cross. You've got marshes on one side, and you've got the mountains, the Hoshi Mountains. It was, it's a place that's almost as insular as England itself. And we didn't suffer as much as we should have through the plague years either, because of that insularity. So, Romania, uh, Ceausescu has fallen not so long ago, as you know. Who was his hero? Vlad. <laughs> Vlad the Impaler was Ceausescu's hero. Uh, because he's the, he was the one figure in Romanian history that Ceausescu would most like to be like. <laughs> their thoughts, <laughs> their thoughts and ideals haven't changed. Technology has crept in, of course, uh, and they have all the technology we have, though uh, not to the extent that we've got it. But they're, they're female. They're a very savage people. They're still a savage people. Uh, if vampirism was a legend spread out of Romania, I decided there must be a reason. So my alien creatures had their base, uh, their source in Romania. And that's why all, all and, and I say that that is the reason why our legends of the vampire have sprung from Romania. So that's how that came about. Mm -hmm. What about the, um, the connection between the, the, the Vampiri and the Romani people? How did that come about? There's a very strong connection in Europe, <coughs> certainly, between the two. Yeah. Uh, gypsies call themselves Sagami in this world. Um, if you're ever in Germany, uh, in, in a little, any of the little villages in Germany, and you want a Sigoyner schnitzel, that's their word for the Zagami. It's the gypsy a piece of uh, gypsy cooked meat. Not a piece of cooked gypsy, you <laughs> understand, but a piece of meat the way gypsies cook it. Um, the vampire needs his serfs in this world and in the other world, the source world. And in the history of the vampire in his own world was that they were feudal, they were territorial. If they put an enemy down, if they, uh, if they discovered a thrall who wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing, he would be banished into what they called the gate, a shining sphere. It was a, it was a, a loop, a wormhole between parallel dimensions. In this world, in our world, it opens in an underground river in Romania. If a vampire lord was banished through the gate, sent to hell, quite literally, his serfs would go with him on occasion. 
In this world, they continue to serve it. And in this world, they call themselves what they call themselves there, Zagani, gypsies, travelers. The reason uh, they were gypsies in their own world is because as free men on the sun side of their planet, forbidden to the vampire, before they were captured in the nights, as free men, they were travelers. And the reason they're travelers is dead simple. They're travelers in this world too, gypsies, Romani. The reason they travel is simple. They don't stay in one spot too long, because the time is going to come when night will fall, the vampires will come across the barrier mountains, and they're goners. So in this world, they did the same. When, when they broke free of their lords in this world, they continued to do what they'd always done since time immemorial in their own world, which was to travel. Rumor or legend or myth if you want to have it, about our own world, has it that the gypsies came out of the Karakaram Mountains of India and spread across the world. Well, in the Necroscope books, I have it that they came through the gate and emigrated, if you will, to the Karakaram Mountains before they spread out across the world. I tried to fit the legends of two worlds into the one strong. So that's where the Zagani came from. They, of course, they're real. That's what Romani, uh, that's what uh, Romani peoples call themselves now. And then you splice that up with a spy story and a guy that talks to the dead. <laughs> How did you come up with that one? Well, I was in the army for 22 years, and towards the end of my time, I think I still had five years to do. My father died. You know? Now, he was an old, he was a coal miner on the northeast coast of England, but he was a knowledgeable uh, guy. He, he was underutilized, he, or he underutilized himself. He never achieved what he could have achieved. He was very interesting. He was uh, a collector of all sorts of things. He loved nothing more than to walk around museums with me, take me around museums, which was an education in itself. Uh, he taught on many subjects, and yet he was very quiet, unless he was pressed he wouldn't. Um, he was satisfied with his lot, probably because as a kid he'd been brought up during the Depression and didn't have a pair of boots until he was nine year old. And there was, but he knew so much, and, and because I was in the army, I never got to talk to him. You know, the older you get, the more you appreciate uh, the people around you, and especially the people who are close to you, mm. uh, which you can't do as a kid because you're a rebel, especially if you were this kid. Mm. Uh, you know, I couldn't wait to get the hell out of there. As soon as, uh, as soon as I heard the call of far lands, I was gone. You know, but later I came to regret this. Anyway, all of those, all of those years spent in the army, and every every two years or so I'd get home for a week. And now it's too late. He's gone. I couldn't speak to him at all. And I remember going home, of course, uh, for his funeral, and he was laid out in, in state, his coffin, his box, and I I wished. I kind of wished that it was too late, but I wished I was able to talk to him again. And just go the things he might have liked to say to me, but I've been either too young to understand them. And now uh, I might be able to glean something from him, you know, except I couldn't, because he was lying there and he didn't have a hell of a lot to say. Um, and that night in the pub, I drank a beer and I thought, well, here's to you, old guy. And, uh, yeah. I would, I would have loved to think that he was enjoying that pint with me. It was a long time later when I thought, what a comma card. How strange. Uh, wouldn't it be something if a guy really could talk to dead people? But not in a seance, not in a psychic sense, but talk to them. Just like you and I are having a conversation now. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Because all the knowledge of the world has gone down into the ground or up into the air in funeral pyres or in burials. Gee, look at the people who are down there. Look at the intelligences who are down there. And wouldn't it be wonderful if, or horrific depending how you think about it, if instead of dying as such, oh, their bodies are corruptible, we all know that. But wouldn't it be wonderful if their minds weren't, and that the, the, great, uh, the great builders continue to build imaginary, world-spanning cities 
and bridges and the great writers continue to write works that can never be read because they are the only ones who know them. They're lost forever. And the scientists and the mathematicians, if that were the case, of course, are the secrets of the universe. But down there in the ground, Harry Keel, the microscope, can talk to these people. And their secrets can be made known to him. Brian's wish fulfilled. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Escapism, if you want. Yeah. Um. The first two books, they, they, they did all right, they did pretty well, those two. Then suddenly there's a third, but... One thing you learn quickly as a writer, you don't kill off a good thing. You try not to, yeah. Well, I almost made a mistake because in the first novel I killed Harry Keel. So I brought him back. Oh, the guy can talk to the dead, what else can he do? Uh, he can re-manifest himself, which he did in about three weeks. And of course, you never kill off a good thing. And by that time, by the time the second book was written, number one was on the bestseller list in America. So there had to be a third to make up the trilogy, uh, which was The Source. And by the time The Source was written, Bamfiri was on the bestseller list in America. And my American publisher was saying, if you, if you, if you kill them off now, I'll kill you. <laughs> you know, tall books were doing good business with the Necroscope series. So there had to be two more. Uh, so the five book series uh, was written. But once you got into the source, you got into the land of the vampiri, which is a whole different kettle of fish to the modern sort of high-flying spy-oriented stories you'd had this side. You had to start right from the beginning, build a world. Yeah, only, only half the book, or two-thirds of the book, uh, really concerns itself with um, with Sunside Star Sign. Mm. The first third of the book is the same. Yeah. Is 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 necroscope Bambi has the spy element. Um uh, as well. Uh yeah, but I it was time to explore the source world of the vampires. It was you know, it was time to take another look. Uh and <coughs> the believer the believability, the very similitude that I've built into the vampires so far. <coughs> this was a difficult thing. No, because I'd established these guys. Now I have to depict their home world and see why they were, how come they were the way they were. So the, the planet was built according to their nature, not that they were built according to the planet's nature. Mm. Uh, I had to work in reverse, which isn't easy. It's not easy. So Source was a hard book to write, in fact. But uh, I, I got it together in the end. And all three of them did um, remarkably well, both sides of the Atlantic. Mm. And the following, and the two books that follow. Um, a lot of people say that they're, they're, the books, the, especially the Necroscope books, contain an awful lot of sex, awful lot of violence. Um, and you were just talking about Splatterpunk. Um, how do you reconcile the two? Well, they don't contain an awful lot of sex. Uh, it's just the bits we remember. <laughs> now, now that's a different thing. That's a different thing. They don't contain an awful lot of sex. Um, there is, there is the, the vampiri are not passive creatures. They're violent creatures. Yeah. Anybody see um, Total Recall the other night on television? Yeah. You talking about violence? Huh? <laughs> My, my books were mild compared with, uh, with uh, Total Recall. There is some violence there, but I hate to sound like, uh, you know, like Kenny Everett, uh, <coughs> young stage actress, who, having done a certain notorious sex scene, says it was all done in best possible time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hate to sound like that, but in fact, I don't think anything I did in the Negroscope books uh, was done out of context. If you talk, all right, so let's look at the sex scenes for a moment. <coughs> With this, there's a scene in, um, in which one? <coughs> in. Yeah, there's a scene in the final book in Dead's Boy, where Harry Keo and the, uh, Harry is now a vampire, a metamorphic creature. He does not have to stay in the same shape he has now. Where he and the Lady Karen are another vampire, of the same 
powers. Make love in the Mobius continuum, which is the mind of God, in fact. So they, they, they do a total thing with God, you could say. But it's not, it's not blasphemous, of course, because Harry is, in effect, just a messenger of the one. Um, but he's a vampire. It's not like you and me making love. Not that we ever have them. Not yet. <laughs> but it's not like you and I doing. These are, these are vampires. They're extreme. <laughs> if a vampire loved any one of you guys, male or female, you're dead. You could not stand the excesses of the vampire. It would kill you, it would crush you, it would destroy you. For a man to be made love to by a vampire, uh, I don't know how best to describe it. Uh, try flinging, uh, yeah, try hurling a chip down a channel tunnel. And uh, this is a similar comparison, it gets lost in the awesome nature of the beast, of the creature. For a woman to be loved by a vampire, well, providing she survives. And of course, it depends on if the vampire wants her to survive. Mm. Well, she would never, ever turn to a man for a lover again. Because, I mean, there is no comparison. There is no such thing as a man that can do what a vampire can do. And I, I beyond that, I won't go without becoming extremely rude. <laughs> um, but um, as I, I, I think I say in the book, uh, you know, uh, fulfilled, a woman fulfilled by a man? Forget it, out of the question, it cannot be. But by a vampire? Every nook and cranny, every crevice, every cavity. Well, let's, let's not get too graphic. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely, you can see it for yourselves, can't you? I can see by a little smiley face. <laughs> So that's, that's the sex side of it. I, I did not think the books would be complete without we understood the nature of the creature. Mm. That's one. And also, it wasn't, the scene isn't a violation because they're both vampires. Um, <clears throat> it pissed me off, in fact. What was the picture? Lawnmower Man? One of the, uh, I haven't seen Lawnmower Man, but I did see one of the pieces of artwork that accompanied a poster, I believe where two figures are melting into each other. Huh? A straight out of, uh, it's it absolutely, the, it's the very scene. When Harry and the Lady Karen kiss, their teeth clash. <laughs> you know, carnosaur, bang! If you can picture two dinosaurs, the ferocity of them, crunch. Well, you need to go no further. <laughs> so sex, I don't think I went over the top at all, no. And violence. Well, how could you write about violent creatures without being violent? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think the, the bloodiest or most unpleasant scene in the Necroscope books was right at the beginning of Necroscope number one, where Dragazani viscerates a dead Russian to, yeah. discover, his, to discover his secrets. Yeah? Yeah. Dragazani's a necromancer and he guts a Russian to find out what he knew. I think that is the most uh, violent or disgusting, if you will, in the books. And when I've read that back to myself recently, um, I didn't find it disgusting at all. Mm. In other words, I've read a lot more stuff since <laughs> then. <laughs> yeah. You're a yeah. sick puppet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, you finished the five books. People still wanted more. So the next was Vampire World. You created a wonderful world. <coughs> um, you went back to the beginning. For that. Uh, sorry, Cheryl, how do you, how do you mean? You went, well, you went back to the beginning of, of, of the vampires. I'm about the source world. Yeah. Yeah. For, for vampire world. Um, mm, oh, I see what you mean. I, I, I you've got a, yeah, you've got, a, you've, you've got a character called Shaitan. 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 Mm. Um, who, who sounds an awful lot like the biblical Satan. He, He's he, a tall. He is beautiful person mm. when he starts. Was, was that a deliberate? Oh yeah, that, that's Shaitan, that's the devil. The first, <coughs> first vampire was uh, Satan himself, yeah. Territorial, greedy, lusty, uh, fallen angel. Uh, it uh, struck me as being the, uh, the obvious answer. And of course it, it did fit in 
with the the premise that the Mubish continuum is the mind of God. The two the two great powers, dark and light, balancing each other out. Mm. Yeah. So Shaitan was was See? the devil. But he manifests in many worlds. So in the vampire world he was Shaitan of the Vampiri. In our world he was Satan. The, the scene at the end of Dead Spawn with Harry on the cross is a, a deliberate allegory. Mm. In fact, uh, Shaitan scorns him and says, hey, if you're so clever, if you're so good, I'll get your woman here. I'm going to kill her. I'm going to do it my way. Why did you come down off the cross and say that? In, in exactly the same way that Christ was tempted. And I, I but I didn't, uh, again, I wasn't blasphemous about um, there would have been howls of rage every time you get anywhere near blasphemy. Do you know what? For Pyth I have one claim to fame, one real claim to fame. The Pythons made a film about me. The Lion of Rome. That's right. <laughs> uh, oh. uh, you know, now that was banned as blasphemous. It wasn't about Jesus. In the opening sequence, the, the three wise men take gold and uh, frankincense and myrrh uh, and give it to Brian's obnoxious mother. Uh, then they go out into the night and discover the true shrine and they rush back in and steal the gold. Get they go back in and take the gold. Everybody missed that. <laughs> so they read the life of Brian as an allegory of the life of Christ, which of course it wasn't that at all. It was merely a funny picture. It wasn't blasphemous. You could let them sense a hint of blasphemy and the world falls on a writer. It really does. Uh, not only in this country, but others. If you doubt it, have a look at Salman Rushdie for some time. Yeah? The world falls away. Well, I didn't want anybody issuing fatwas on me. <laughs> you, know? you know? But nobody, despite that uh, everybody has read the allegory that I've just mentioned into those stories, nobody has ever blamed me of being, uh, accused me of being blasphemous. At all. Ever. Mm. So I'm not worried if it doesn't concern me. Despite the fact that you've got Harry Keogh, who at the end was your Christ figure, also beginning, being the beginning. Of the, of, of the vampires. That's right. Light balances darkness. Um, so you carried on with Blood, Blood Brothers. So we, 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 you're taking the story on from the end of, or the supposed end of Karen, Harry Keogh, the disappearance of Harry Keogh into the, into the continuum. Um, and you've got Blood Brothers, um, you've got the second one out. The last of your year. Um, any more? Yes, Blood Wars. It's, it's, it's finished. It's the last. It's the end of the. Uh, it's the end of that trilogy. Uh -huh. And that will come out. That'll be out in about a year's time, or oh, less than a year's time. It's a quarter of a million words. The manuscript is 1,022 pages long. Well. Um, it, it ties in the next couple books as well. So we get cameo appearances of various people. Right, so this is this is not actually a continuation after Blood Brothers. This is filling in the lost bits in between. No, no, Blood Brothers, uh, The Last Eerie, and Blood Wars is one book. Yeah. But publishers balk at a book which is uh, seven hundred and twenty thousand words long, and, mm. and you know, and that's why it uh, appeared in three uh, books. Now in England, the publishers were wise enough to call it Brian Lonely's Vampire World, Volume One. Volume 2, Volume 3. In America, they weren't. They didn't call Brian Lovelace one by one. They said Blood Brothers. And people, when they got the end, were highly pissed off to find that it wasn't the end. Mm. Yeah, but a year later, they were delighted to find that they continue reading the story. Uh, and now they realize that it was a, an error of the publisher and not of the author. Mm. So, yeah, Blood Wars finishes that, that trilogy. So, that gives you eight books. And on the wheel, the number. At best, <laughs> and you never kill a good thing off. <laughs> <laughs> between yeah, between Vampiri and the Sauce, Harry Keogh spent eight years looking for his lost wife and child. This is a man who can talk to dead people, who can travel anywhere on the globe in an instant of time, who who can talk to so many interesting people, and with so many interesting friends, and with such a background. Eight years. Is that all he did? Look for his wife and child? So, um, I shall, it'll be a ten book uh, series. I'm, I'm starting work almost immediately. I will be when I get home uh, on Necroscope of Watch Girls. Well, 
Well, we'll, we'll wind up this interview now, then, so you can go home and start my work. I'll wait for the next one. All right. <laughs> um, I want to ask you what, what sort of, I mean, we, we know that you read um, the early pulps and, and, and H.P. Lovecraft. What do you read now when you assume you've got a chance to read? I don't. I haven't read any. I, I think I've read Jack Vance, um, who's my favourite science fiction writer. Uh, and I think I've read only Jack Vance, maybe one or two short stories by friends, personal friends, by Carl Wagner and Dennis Etchison, Ramsey Campbell, one or two others. Uh, but I've scanned books, I've looked at books, I'm aware of what's going on. I know what's being written, uh, you know. Uh, I've tried one or two of the Splatterpunk stories that I said, and I can't. I can't, not only can I not write them, I can't read them. Uh, I know it's, so I know it's there, but I, I'm almost afraid to read too much when I'm writing, because I don't want to pick up something from somebody else. If I can illustrate that point, I once wrote about a last redoubt at the end of the world, something similar to William Hope Hodgson's The Nightlands, but not the same. Uh, and I gave it a title, and I was two chapters into it, and it was about a man, a, a group, trapped in a place that they couldn't escape from, an isolated uh, environment. Uh, and when I'm out downtown, I spot a book uh, called The Shining. And I went home and ripped up my two chapters and threw them away. Uh, it's, it's, it's a dangerous thing to read other people's work when you're working on something mm -hmm. because it might throw you completely. And I'm also, I'm, also I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm pretty much like a computer myself. I'm afraid of viruses, other writer viruses, the mistakes they make or, or the good things they do. You know, I don't want people to point finger and say, but that's exactly like, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, if it turns out that a book of mine is exactly like, too late it's written. It's gone to the publisher. Yeah, I I would prefer that to happen than to find I'm ripping up another two chapters of another novel. Yeah. So Jack Vance, however, I think he's quite wonderful and he's very different and uh, different to anybody else I've ever read. And I'm not going to steal anything I don't think from Jack Vance, except maybe the atmosphere of uh, the Dragon Masters. Yeah. But that's a, that's a unavoidable. If you're going to write about a world where people make monsters, then you know it's going to, again you've got that similarity. Yeah, there's only so much things you can do with a vat of biological gunge, I suppose. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the human biological gunge. <laughs> <laughs> they got at the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've been stunning you. <laughs> well, you know too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Brian, you're going to do a reading for us. I was going to read Fruiting Bodies, but I've read it to you before, apparently, two or three years ago. Uh, I think, well, I, I, I've been told it was a Nomadicon anyway, so I was stuck. Now, fortunately, the folder I picked up with Fruiting Bodies in had a much shorter piece, which should only take about 25. And this is kind of tongue-in-cheek, which is uh, something of a rare sidestep for me. But uh, if you'll bear with me, if you would like to, I'll read this one too. <coughs> so it's not, it's not a very serious piece, put it that way. And it's called Swamped. And it's more science fiction than horror. <coughs> Swamp then. Sir, Miss Pollock's voice inquired over the intercom. Are you busy? She knew I was not busy, but it sounded good. Extremely, I snapped, doodling in the margin of my newspaper and gloomily considering a crossword clue. Three across, exude foraminifers calcareously on the sea floor. Four letters, the third one being a Z, or if you're an American, a Z, possibly. Sir, she was impatient. Miss Pollock, what is a foraminifer? A rhizopod, she who knows everything, for which reason I employ her, that and the fact that she has pointy tits. <laughs> answered at once. Chiefly marine and microscopic. Rhizopod. The word had a Z anyway, so there might be a connection of that. Thank you, Miss Pollock. Sir, there's a gentleman to see you, she insisted. He hasn't an appointment, but he says it's urgent, extremely. We needed the money. Will you ask him to wait, Miss Pollock, and come in for a moment? She came in. Yes, sir. Does he look like he has money? He looks odd, but then most of them do. I told him your rates and that didn't phase him. Phase. I glanced quickly at my crossword. Third letter, a Z. 
possibly, but no, the phase was no good. Okay, send him in, I told her, and wait. Sir, what's a rhizopod? <laughs> a chalk or chitin-shelled protozoan. I snapped my fingers. For chalk, read calcium. Exude foraminifers calcareously. On her way out, Miss Pollock turned up my air conditioning, explaining he pongs a bit. Pardon? He's been in something. She wrinkled her nose, up to his knees in it. Then she was through the door and gone. Weber, he squeaked, moments later, clearing his throat. I'm not going to squeak, I'll have difficulty. I haven't got a throat that squeaks. <laughs> Weber, he squeaked, moments later, clearing his throat as he squelched into my office and left a green trail of footprints on my neutral grey carpet. David Weber, I stared at him hard and he gazed back for a moment, then turned his face and eyes away. Inferiority complex, possibly. Understandable, since he was so obviously inferior. And from the moment I saw him <laughs> leap to that conclusion, I knew I was, I was in the long, wrong line of work. I'd suspected it before, but now I knew it. The psychiatrist must have sympathy for, empathy with his clients. I didn't even know David Bloody Weber, but already I knew that I could never possibly identify with him and would never, ever feel sympathetic towards him. He was a protozoan, a foraminifer, and judging by the slime on my carpet, he was aquatic to boot, amphibian certainly. I wanted to shout at him, see him cringe, but we needed the money. What can I do for you, Mr. Kitan, a Weber? I asked. <laughs> Standing to glare down on him and crush his hand. He trembled, he sweated, despite the air conditioning, I could smell the stuff on his trousers, which looked like he'd been standing in a bowl of very ancient soup for a long time. He shrugged awkwardly. Not much, I reckon, but, but, I don't like buts. But it was your name, Smith, and it was this building. God, and I could be doing my crossword puzzle. My name is common enough, surely. I tried to smile encouragingly. Not in that place, he said, shuddering. Nothing is common there. Anyway, it was your whole name, Smythe Smith, and he nodded knowingly. And this building, you say? I stood up, led him to my couch, draped one end with pages from the sports section, and stretched him out, hands clasped over his abdomen. Parallel universe, I think, he told me, <laughs> blinking rapidly through the thick lenses of his specs. God, he was ugly, a real trog. Oh, yes, I nodded understandingly, which they expect. And you've been there, hey? Far too often, he sighed. Oh, yes, indeed. I took a pad and pencil, sat down beside him, his top end, and said, well, you just lie there and decide where to start, and I'll take notes as we go. How does that sound? That's okay, he answered, biting his lip. Just give me a second, that's all. His pale brow got all creased up as his thoughts sorted themselves out, and while he was about it, I looked him over closely and tried to discover what it was about him that so irked to me. Possibly it was that he was a nothing. I mean, why bother to be anything at all if he can't be something? Why exist in the first bloody place? Surely not just to foul up my carpet. Lord, how I hated him. He was, oh, five foot three, about 100 pounds, soaking wet, 30 years old, pallid, pimply, insect ravaged, casually clad in green cord jacket and trousers, chucker boots, and a camouflaged mosquito neck neckerchief, mosquito net neckerchief, and putties, and a fifth helmet. And this was July. <laughs> like a poor man's Woody Allen, if that image helps. I think I hated the pith helmet worst of all, <laughs> or possibly the fact that he was unquestionably sane. When you've been in the game as long as I have, you know these things instinctively. David Webber was not a real nut, hardly a candidate for the funny farm, in no way a goofball, but yes, he had problems. It started, this could have been part of the uh, take me. It started, he began, with the dreams. Bad dreams, anxiety, possibly. Very bad. Recurrent dream, <coughs> guilt, perhaps. Oh yes, night after night. And always the same dream, obsession, always. Which you first had when you were a small child, he frowned. How do you know that? And which invariably accompanied your bedwetting. I was triumphant. Bollocks, he said. <laughs> I never wet the bed in my life. <laughs> I was devastated. Go on, I told him, gritting my teeth. I was in a swamp, he said, but a swamp like no swamp you ever imagined. Wait, I stopped him, this was a dream. Yes, but you mentioned the parallel dimension. Dreams do not come into that category, not strictly speaking. He shrugged, it's debatable, but I agree. The parallel dimension idea didn't come until later when things started to follow me back. From the swamp, you mean? Yes, like the muck on your trousers, the sports section, my bloody carpet, I snapped. Well, yes, he shrank down into himself. Listen, I'm sorry about it, let me shrink. 
I told him sternly, cutting him off, I don't like the word. <laughs> I never apologize. It only puts my rates up. The carpet doesn't matter. I just had it cleaned, that's all. But do go on. That swamp, he said, it's hell. It's alien. There are bugs with three legs, others with eight. There are animals with six legs, but armored like beetles. With, with chitin, I asked. Armored like beetles. With chitin, I asked. Or, calcariously, he blinked. What? Like protozoans, I patiently explained. Little, tiny little foraminifers. Hell no, these are damn big things. Some of the bugs are big as your fist and they bite. Jesus, <laughs> you see these bites? His face, neck, hands and wrists were quite badly bitten. Hence the headgear, I nodded, and a mosquito net, which you thought was draped over the helmet. Mm -hmm. Hey, right, he beamed at me in appreciation, however shyly. And the putties are to keep them from getting up my trousers, right. Mm -hmm. I tried to hide my pleasure, but maybe he wasn't such a bad guy after all. <laughs> Do go on. In my dreams, <coughs> I make my way through the swamp. This isn't easy, believe me, as well as the smaller insects and animals, there are some real monsters, like prehistoric, you know. Tyrannosaurus, I said at least. <coughs> and leeches, big as squirrels, that drop on you out of the creepers. Anyway, I work towards a place where the tops of the buildings are sticking up out of the mud and slime. Now try to get a picture, this is a jungle. A genuine tropical or prehistoric jungle, but not earth tropics, not earth prehistory. This is a time stream which diverged eons ago and went along entirely different lines. It's another place, another time, a parallel dimension and weird. Let's see what we have here, I said. You think your dreams are parallel dimension. You believe that your tiny walnut mind houses an entire world coexistent with this one. He wasn't mad, I stuck to my guns on that, but conceited. Exactly, coexistent and conterminous. Ah, there's a common boundary. Where, my inquire? Oki Finoki. Here, he said, thumbing himself in the chest. I rubbed my chin thoughtfully, it's a bore, but another one of those things they seem to expect. So, you are the gateway to and from a parallel world which exists only in your dreams. Is that it? Not quite, he shook his head. As I've already more than hinted, uh, hinted, it doesn't exist only in my head. I backed my chair hastily away from him, as, to illustrate his point, something green hopped croaking from the hollow of his neck onto the floor. It was like a tiny frog, but had the wrong number of legs. Croaking again, it hopped under my desk out of sight. No more tricks, I shouted, unnerved. Man, that's why I'm here, he shouted back getting up on his elbows. You think I can help it? You think I, I like it? He was close to tears. I pursed my lips, straightened my tie, shrugged. Okay, grudgingly. The dream, the jungle, the tops of creeper-infested buildings sticking up through the gunge, the leech squirrels dropping on you, this entire parallel world place which doesn't exist only in your head. Get on with it. He lay down again. You know about entropy? A little. I have no problem with it. It's no one's problem. Entropy isn't, not anymore. The universe is no longer expanding and expanding. It's shrinking, condensing. It's moving back towards another big bang. As space shrinks, so does time. Ah, but my argument presupposes that you understand the theory of parallel time streams. I do, I snapped, still smart, smarting from both shrinks, but realizing that the man was simply a peasant, a matter of birth and breeding beyond his control. At each individual moment of time, every personal thing has an almost infinite choice as to his, her, its course of action, progression. In some far superior time dimension, you did not come in here, and I'm still happily engaged in pondering the relationship between calcareous mini crustacea and ocean floor exudations. Correct. Weather beamed, then he frowned. Except that choice is now, tonight. Worse than that, the time streams are no longer parallel. They're converging. Utterly alien worlds spawned billions of years ago in Earth's nightmare prime, which have evolved along lines as strange as the worlds of distant stars are now closing in, beginning to impinge upon this one. I am a focal point, genius loci, a gateway, yes, but I'm only one gateway, there may well be others. Explanation time, I told him. You're obsessed with your dreams, your daydream, your delusion. But it is a delusion, believe me. You're not mad, not yet, but you are sickening. He really was sickening, which is why I now suggest a course of treatment and ultimately a cure. God only let it be, he breathed a sigh. I mean, Sooner or later it's going to get me on my way here in broad daylight, in the middle of a city street, for Christ's sake. Suddenly I was there, up to my knees in it. See, he pointed at his slimy trousers. I was only there for a second, then back on the street again, but... But me no buts, I said, holding up my hand and turning my face away. Have I not explained? You were deluded, a victim of your mind's fictions. The slime is real, he said, but it does not issue from the swamp in some alien parallel world. Where then? You think I carry buckets of the stuff around with me? And when the mood is on, I simply pour it over my trousers? Is that what you're saying? No, no, I thought hard. 
It is perhaps a poltergeist phenomenon. You do it to yourself. Psychosomatic self-persecution, ESP, parapsychology. And something slithered slimily away from his crotch, plopped onto the floor and shot under the desk to do battle with the, the frog thing. <laughs> and these things, ectoplasm, I answered. The most icky ectoplasm at that. Involuntary psychic uh, exudations, yes. You would appear to house, I considered it, not a parallel dimension, but a gunja geist. <laughs> <laughs> hey, a word of my own manufacture, I shrugged it off expansively. A slime slinging ghost. Rid me of it, he cried. Exorcise the bloody thing. I will, I will, I placated him. But first tell me more about the dream. I hate to admit it, but it's interesting. He composed himself. Where was I? Oh, yes. So I get to this building, or rather the top of this building, and there's an old rotting flagpole bending over with its burden of creepers and what have you. And there's a tatty rag of a flag flying up there above the groping, slimy green foliage. I run it down and read what it says. It's mouldy, of course. Everything in that place is mouldy. But I can still make out what it says. Yes, it says, Merbler Enterprises. Ah, it's this building, do you see? Certainly this is the Merbler building, I answer. Indeed it is, and I'm required to pay exorbitant fees for the use of these offices in said edifice, which is to say that my time is limited, and I allocate only so much to each client. Please go on and hurry. You're on top of the Merbler building, which protrudes from the surface of a mighty swamp. What happens then? That's where you come in, he said, and that's why I'm here. It was too much of a coincidence. See, after I've read what's on the flag, I look round and there's this piece of wood, 18 inches by 6, chamfered edges, black paint flaking off, gold lettering still intact, floating on the quag, and the gold letters spell your name, Smythe Smith, psychiatrist. Hmm. Hums are useful, if only to fill gaps. So, it would seem your fantasy has suggested its own cure, or rather, it has signposted the way to that salvation. Perhaps, he seemed wary, but on the other hand, it could be a warning. Explain. Well, in order to reach this bit of wood, this nameplate, which incidentally is that selfsame plank which adorns the door entering into these rooms, which I noted upon entering to be loose and about to detach itself. In order to reach it, I reach out and inadvertently step off the parapet of the building, the roof, that is, which lies, as does the entire city, under the slop, and down I go in the filth, which tugs at me like quicksand. I grab at a creeper and it snaps. Now the muck is up to my neck, not only my head, now only my head protrudes on one hand. The goo creeps over my chin, into my mouth. You wake up? Yes, thank God. He shuddered pitifully, and I found myself wishing I could pity him. My solution is expensive, I said. What is money? Even more expensive, I told him. I propose to hypnotize you, revisit your dream, then neatly excise it, or exorcise it, if you insist, utterly from your conscious and unconscious minds, so that it may never return. My instrument of excision shall be a simple post-hypnotic command. You're going to put me to sleep. He seemed alarmed, and for the first time I noticed the sagging dark bags under his eyes. You certainly look like you could use it, I said. But I can't sleep. I mustn't add end. Can't you see that? I sighed. But that's precisely why you must. Don't you bloody listen to anything anyone says to you? Knowing I have to be rid of it doesn't make me any less frightened of it, he said logically. It's like a vast version of a bad tooth. Then you accept my proposition? Only if you guarantee it will work. I guarantee that you will be no worse off. Very well. So lie back and relax. Good. Close your eyes. Think sleep. God, how you need sleep. You're really knackered. Man, you're shagged out. You're going to go to sleep right now. You're so tired. Even my words are losing their meaning. Everything is losing its meaning. What the hell is meaning? There is no meaning. Only sleep. 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 When I say to you, Calcereus foraminifers, you will fall instantly into a deep, 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 deep sleep. Here we go. Calcereus foraminifers. He snored. Where are you? Mobile building, he mumbled. On top of it? Inside it. Private consultation room of. Yes, I know that, I snapped. But well, what are you doing there? Sleeping. Good. Now, do you remember the swamp? God, yes. I want you to go there. Go there now. He began to move fitfully, cursed under his breath, twitched and grimaced. Are you there? Yes. Okay, now then, keeping an eye peeled for squirrel leeches, make your way to the place with the flagpole. That's it. Over there. Fight your way through the swamp toward it. Careful. You nearly trodden the purse, your soldiers, then. But now you can see the place in the murky distance, the tatty flag fluttering over the misty green canopy of... Can it? He mumbled. I'm there already. Don't anticipate me, I snarled. <laughs> okay, so you've read the flag and you know this is the Merbler building. 
Now you see the nameplate which you try to reach and shit yelped, floundering on my couch. The slime is covering your shoulders, your neck, lapping at your chin. Get me out of glug. His mouth gaped and his chest heaved. He sucked desperately at air, but nothing seemed to be getting in. I grabbed at his suddenly flailing arms, trapped his hands, began to draw him upright. It's okay, I can save you. See, I can pull you from the slime. I can save you from your dream, your obsession, your fantasy. I can, what the hell? He weighed half a ton, literally. This little shovel guy, a meat built like a brick conservatory, and he was slipping from my grip, squeezing back down onto the couch, sucked down by the slop. His gungeon geist was a tough bastard, all right. When I snapped my fingers and say, rise or pod exudations, I changed my tack. All of this, this entire fantasy and all that's causing it will disappear utterly forever and you will wake up, do you understand? Glug, glug, glug. And you will never, never, ever dream that dream or imagine that fantasy or suffer that aberration again, right? Glug, glug, arg, glug. He, he stopped flopping about, lay still, head blowing.